friends good evening and greetings everyone from the ecumenical christian center and church of south india for this 21st by the contextualized biblical hermeneutics online series of lectures so far we have successfully completed 20th lecture this evening is the 24 21st lecture we have on a series of this wider contextualized biblical hermeneutics it is jointly organized by the ecumenical christian center and church of south india this evening the topic for the lecture is the message of the book of revelation by dr biju chako so we invite the speaker I would like to introduce him to you. Dr. Biju Chakko completed Bachelor of Divinity from Serampur College, Kolkata, and he did his research, Doctor of Theology from the United Theological College, Bangalore. Formerly, he was a Dean of Academic Affairs at New Theological College, Dehradun. and he was also a managing editor of dune theological journal and coordinator of the publication department at ntc presently dr chako served as associate professor of new testament at ntc dehradun uttaranchal dr bijus chako published several articles related to the new testament studies which were published in national and international journals we are so delighted to have you sir and we are really excited to listen from you on the subject the message of the book of revelation we invite you to take this exciting lecture over to you sir thank you sir a very good evening to all of you and a warm welcome i want to thank uh, uh, reverend tangbing lun waipei uh, the moderator of this session and the deputy director of uh, ecumenical christian center bangalore and also the director father matthew uh, of ecumenical christian center uh, i would also like to convey my appreciation to ecc and the church of south india for this opportunity in such a time as this that we people from across the nation and outside could join together in studying the scripture i also would like to uh, thank uh, our my principal our principal at ntc who also joined for uh, this evening's lecture uh, i believe that scripture is the common treasure irrespective of our denominational or geographical differences that we have at least in terms of the new testament the 27 books though we differ in terms of interpretation or in terms of our perspectives and hermeneutical approaches we have this book as the common book for all the christians and i would like to read a portion from the book of revelation as we begin our study today the book of revelation chapter 7 verses uh, 9 and 10 after these things i looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and all peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cry out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb the larger picture in the dream in the project of god is to see that his people coming from across the globe 
right? A multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic, transnational, polyglotic group of people coming together and dwelling, uh, dwelling together. And thanks to ACC and CSI Church for organizing uh, this, uh, the so that our coming together is making a symphony. Uh, and in microcosm, we see the picture of revelation there. Very specially, I would like to express my gratitude to Reverend Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti, my teacher and uh, the one who coordinates um, and invited me for this program for giving uh, this opportunity to study together the scripture. Let's uh, move into the message of the book of book of Revelation. Let's see. I'll be reading this one and let's see the the introduction. No other book in the New Testament gives such an adoring vision of a justice and peace embodied uh, new heaven and new earth, a vision of the world in the making as the book of Revelation does. First and foremost, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this book is a challenge for the church at all times to withdraw from the oppressive political, economic, social, and religious realities of the empire and to live even now in the worship and service of God who is making all things new. Undoubtedly, the book of Revelation has stimulated many debates among Christians throughout centuries. This book is indeed a reservoir of Christian hymns and songs. Shillington avows that perhaps the book of Revelation is best understood when it is put to music. It is an anti-imperial post-colonial narrative with a grotesque critique of empire, not only Roman, but empires and hegemonies of all times and forms. In addition to this, the book of Revelation played a pivotal role in the formation of church dogma on eschatology. But we need to remember the book of Revelation is more dramatic than it is dogmatic, more musical than prosaic, more visionary than programmatic. This book underscores the fears and anxieties of early Christian communities. Its generic character refuses to yield a single and simple in, in interpretation with its highly symbolic articulation and theological et musical, dramatic and visionary textures, the author calls for an uncompromising stand, resisting the allurement and attraction of the empire. Since the generic features are important in understanding any literature, it is important to locate this book in the context of apocalyptic literature. So let's look at these <laughs> apocalyptic, apocalypticism and apocalypse. Apocalyptic ideas definitely played a pivotal role in Judaism as well as in Christianity. The famous statement of Ernest Caseman, apocalyptic was the mother of all Christian theology, though a bit overstated, exemplifies this. At this literature received only a random attention in the beginning as observed by Koch. Apocalyptic literature is a kind of resistant literature, which is its own form, content and function. But such resistant literatures were not limited to Judaism and Christianity, rather, it was a common feature of many religious ideologies. The apocalyptic literature is a reflection of the resilience of ostracized communities in their given socio-religious and politico-historical cultural metrics. The word apocalyptic is derived from the Greek word apocalypsis, which means a revelation, disclosure, or make things known. The frequently used terms like apocalyptic, apocalypticism, and apocalypse are differentiated by the scholars. According to Charles Worth, apocalyptic is an adjective that has been used to describe both a certain type of literature and a special feature of religions in late antiquity. P.D. Hansen observes that though the word apocalyptic is an adjective, it has come to designate 
a phenomenon of the disclosure of heavenly secrets in visionary form to a seer for the benefit of a religious community experiencing suffering or perceiving itself victimized by some form of deprivation. Now, abandoning the use of apocalyptic as a noun, scholars prefer to use apocalyptic eschatology as a set of ideas and motives that is evidenced even in other literary genres and social settings. Thus, apocalyptic includes set of ideas and motives where eschatology plays a pivotal role and can be found in texts that does not strictly adhere to this genre of literature. Apocalypticism is a social ideology that propels any apocalyptic movement. Apocalyptic literature is the product of such movements. Thus, recent scholarship considers apocalypse as a particular literary type and a literary genre employed by apocalyptic writers to accumulate their message. J.J. Collins identifies two types of apocalypses, namely historical apocalypse, in which revelation is most often conveyed in symbolic visions and presence an overview of history culminating in a crisis and the second type of apocalypses involving otherworldly journey where, which are mystical in orientation. Russell avows that apocalyptic is esoteric in character, literary in form and symbolic in language and pseudonymous in authorship. Now, having said this as the background of the book of Revelation, where we can locate this book, let's see the genre of this book. What kind of a book is this? The interpretation of any literature has to do with the identification of the genre to which a writing or a document belongs. Therefore, recognizing the book Revelation as an apocalyptic work is an important step in unraveling the mysteries wrapped up in extraordinary visions. The first work that is introduced as an apocalypsis, we know, is the book of Revelation. At first impression, if you look at the book of Revelation, it resembles like a letter to be read by an audience. You read in chapter 1 and chapter 28. However, the author sets aside this apostolary uh, epistolary form of his composition as he progresses the central section of the work for the main body looks like a homily so it looks like a letter it looks like a homily but look at what the author claims about this literature this book he identifies his writing as a prophecy so we have three things at this stage one is an epistle another is a homily another is a prophecy Apocalyptic literature is often considered as an offshoot of biblical prophecy. Therefore, the book of Revelation has yep. its moorings in the prophetic tradition. Luke Timothy mm. Johnson points out three distinguishing aspects by which the book of Revelation breaks the mold of ordinary apocalypses and become very unique. They are the creative and artistic style. And secondly, the resemblance of Jewish Merkaba mysticism, especially in the heavenly hall scenes with its hymns and liturgy. And above all, thirdly, the portrayal of Christ by an author well-known to readers. So this is not a pseudonymous work who describes his own experience of the risen Lord, which elevates this book far above other Jewish apocalyptic writings. Though this book employs an epistolary framework and identifies itself as a prophecy, it begins with a specification that it is an apocalypse. In the words of Witherington, Ben Witherington, apocalyptic is a type of hybrid literature that reflects the confluence of Jewish prophetic and sapiential traditions. Fiorenza argues in the same line to some extent as she sees the convergence between Christian prophecy and Christian apocalypse. Therefore, it should be, the book should be treated above all as a Christian apocalypse and a hybrid literature. Unlike the, the, the next important question that we will deal with is the authorship of the book of Revelation. Unlike other apocalyptic works, the majority of scholars would argue Revelation 
is not a pseudonymous work. That means a work bearing a false name of the author. Because the author himself introduces as John the servant of Jesus Christ. Later he calls himself as a prophet. And in addition to this, there are three places where the name John is mentioned. The author takes for granted that the readers will know him without giving further details. And it becomes evident that he is well informed about the background and spiritual condition of the seven churches to whom he writes. It is frequently proposed that though writing in Greek, his first language was Hebrew. Thus, it can also be deduced that uh, the author was familiar. He was familiar with the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. And he was a Jewish Christian who was well versed in the apocalyptic traditions of his time. According to early Christian testimony, the church fathers, the author is John the Apostle. But many did not agree with that. Firstly, because the author does not appeal to his apostolic authority and not even once the author gives any indication to the readers that he is an apostle. Secondly, if one accepts that John the Apostle is the authority behind the fourth gospel, then it would be impossible to regard him as the author of the book of Revelation. There are major differences between them in language, style, and content. The author of the fourth gospel writes freely in Greek, but Revelation is full of clumsy idioms, unusual constructions, and Semitic expression. Some attempts have been made to explain these differences. But these proposals the, uh, overlook the fact that the differences cannot be explained simply in terms of language, for they are also distinct from one another in terms of content and theology. Many key Johannine terms are absent from the book of Revelation. For example, light, truth, love, and those terms. Such consideration make it impossible, according to most of the commentators, to regard the author of the fourth gospel as having composed the book of Revelation. But at the same time, having said that, there are sufficient common themes also between them to suggest some kind of relationship between them. In the light of this, we should at least argue that they are from the same theological school in Asia Minor. There are people who see this as a pseudonym, just like any other apocalyptic writings, but we cannot, we cannot prove that. There are attempts from the commentators to identify the author with prominent figures who bore the name John, including John the Elder, Presbyter, John Mark, and even John the, John the Baptist. C.K. Barrett proposes that the author was a disciple of John the Apostle, the author of the fourth gospel. But having, said, having analyzed these different proposals from scholars, we can come to this conclusion what could be said with certainty is that the author was a Jewish Christian prophet whose name was John. He stands in the same threshold of the Hebrew prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. There is a possibility that this author might have hailed from some part of Asia Minor or one who has been living in some part of Asia Minor for quite some time now. Even if one may argue that gospel and revelation are from two authors, it seems they belong to the same theological school in Asia Minor. So some kind of a connection between them, we need to argue. The next important thing is date. There are three views regarding this among the scholars, depending upon the Roman rulers that they foresee behind these narratives. Number of commentators view that this is coming towards the end of uh, uh, 95 C, the first century. Uh, and that dating is because uh, Irania specifically states that Revelation was written during the end of the reign of Domitian. So if you argue for a period during Domitian's reign, then the date is 95. Similarly, if people argue for a date somewhere around Nero's time or immediately after that, we should argue for 68 C. Similarly, if people proposes a date during the time of Vespasian, then uh, it could be somewhere around 75 to 79. 
this uh, is based on uh, Revelation 17. However, having said these three positions, and there are people who even uh, argue for a later date, beginning of second century, uh, looking at the time of Emperor Hadwe and somewhere around 113 to 170. But these three are the most important proposals. And among them, the internal evidences seem to support a date towards the end of first century C. It's often proposed that the situation of the churches reflected in Revelation 2 to 3 favors a later date. These chapters describe, first of all, there is a great deterioration in the spiritual condition of some of the churches. A decline of this could only have taken place over a number of years, a long time after Paul or other missionaries had established churches in these centers. According to Polycarp, for example, if you look at Polycarp suggests that the church in Smyrna was not established until 60 to 64 C, but Revelation suggests that it had been in existence at least for uh, some years. There is also evidence that Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake in 60 to 61 C, but by the time of the composition of Revelation, it had once again been established as a prosperous city. Chapter 3, verse 70. These factors, when considered together, point to a later date. Revelation seems to have been written during the period of persecution, during a period when there was immense tension existed between the church and the state. Witherington argues that the Christological references that counterbalance Christ against the Lordship and deity of the emperor best suit a post-Neronian period of New Testament history. This does not appear to be a major concern for Paul during his day. Though Neronian date needs to be given its due, the cumulative evidences that we have analyzed suggest a date towards the end of first century C. Now let's look at the socio-political context and the readers of this uh, book. John states clearly at the outset it was itself that he was in the island of Patmos. And there he received the commission of the risen Lord to write to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Patmos, we know, is an island in the Aegean Sea, around 35 miles of the western coast of modern Turkey, towards the direction of Greece. John says his readers lived in the cities of Asia Minor, and he sets the whole vision in a ritual time that is on the Lord's day. It's a common scholarly consensus that the book of Revelation was written during the time of social conflict between Rome and Christians. In heightening the conflict, the imperial cult and its magnitudes played a key role. It is in this line, Osborne was, that any conclusive view on social setting will be determined by one's view regarding the imperial cult and the extent of persecution. While many argue for some kind of persecution, there are others like Adela Yabo Collins and L. Thompson who were reluctant to go with this conclusion. Collins uh, sees four areas of social tensions, such as church and the synagogue, Christians in the Gentile world, hostility towards Rome, and tension between rich and poor. For her, the main problem was economic exploitation and cultural imperialism. Jane Krebel also feels the issue is not persecution, but compromise. He argues that it was, it was not only an apocalypse of Jesus Christ, but also one that unmasked the empire, Rome in this case, and how the empire beast allures the people of God. On the other hand, having said that, Fiorenza observes that majority of commentators agree that a revelation reflects a political religious conflict with the Roman Empire and persecution of the church in Asia Minor under Domitian. Moreover, Eusebius reflection regarding the cruel persecution of Christians by the Romans throughout the first three centuries cannot be glossed over as a mere exaggeration. It is in this line Witherington argues that evidences are plenty to support that Christian did go through severe persecution and especially during and after Domitian's time, Christians were under significant social pressure to conform to the imperial cult. The imperial cult, which began, which became a prominent cultic practice in Rome of its contours to a large extent to the Macedonians, the Greeks, 
who might have inherited it from the Asiatic regions. For the Greeks, the distinction between God and human is not too far, as both could exchange their status. In addition to this, personification of the city with a deity also influenced the emperor cult. Thus, loyalty to God or goddess of the city was understood to be loyalty to the city or nation at large. It acted as a social link that connected all people. Participation in the imperial cult thus become the mark of their loyalty to the empire. This is just like the present regime in India, either you are with us or you are anti-nationals. The temple precincts during those times also served as functionaries of banks, trading centers, and other financial institutions. Thus, imperial cult in the antiquity was concerned with religio-political and socio-economic aspects. In short, it affected all arenas of life. We know culturally, Romans uh, inherited many of the Hellenistic practices and religious customs. Though politically, Rome was ruling, the Hellenistic culture deeply impacted the language, philosophy, and thoughts of the empire. Though victorious Roman generals received divine honors in the East, they were not treated in the same way in Rome, and it took several years and serious protests before the concept of divinity of the living emperor gained currency. And we know the history during the time of Julius Caesar and the assassination and later uh, Marcus Antony trying to uh, get hold of this, then Octavian who later renamed as Augustus, who is, uh, uh, who is recognized as the God Augustus at his birth by the Roman Senate. Some emperors demanded this, Others did not publicly demanded or the paraphernalia, the flatterers who were around them ascribed these title to them. It has slowly become a measuring road for political loyalty. Emperor cult become a test for Christians to test their loyalty to Christ. No wonder then there would be some amount of hostility between Christians and illegal religion and the ruling Rome. In addition to this, the hostility or tension between Rome and the church, there were also tension between Judaism and Christianity. We read those in the, in the book. Witherington has argued that Domitian used either confinement or deportation as a means of punishment, which was often intended for a life term. Possibly, John was suffering such a deportation and the readers might have faced actual social crises like social harassment, ridicule, discrimination, and oppression for their religious beliefs. The community apparently met on the Lord's Day as they recognized Jesus as the firstborn of the dead. By noting the combination of various terms um, like servant, prophecy, uh, prophet, uh, testimony, holy ones, Johnson suggests that it is a community, it's a community of saints. Let's uh, look at the purpose of this book. Why would anyone write a book like this? What could have been the possible purposes in carefully formulating such an account like the book of Revelation? Number one, we know that in the light of the social context, in the light of the political cultural context, we know that there was a practical comfort and encouragement, and we cannot dilute that purpose. Number two, it is written to provide the reader a better understanding what their faith in Christ would do for them. Number three, it is also written to provide a constant reminder to Christians that Christ would return at any time and therefore to challenge them to be faithful just as Christ remained faithful to his vocation. And not the last, but not the least, it is to provide a counter rhetoric to imperial ideologies and we cannot gloss over that. Let's also briefly look at uh, the interpretation of the book of Revelation. Uh, this is a historical overview. We want, I won't be reading the whole section, but highlighting the main thing there. It's important to have a bird's eye view of the history of the interpretation of the book of Revelation. 
a detailed description of the history of interpretation is not aimed, but an overview of its history and the various methods readers employed in reading this book would suffice at this point. We know that it is a common knowledge that the Western fathers often questioned the canonicity of this book, you know, including scholars like Eusebius. There were conflicts from the beginning over the material interpretation that things will happen materially and a mystical symbolic interpretation, imagining that the events related are referring to spiritual realities, which continues even today. In the symbolic reading, Revelation was not predicting the future, rather it would present images of struggles between good and evil in the world. During the patristic period, the church fathers interpreted it from various vantage points. Church fathers like Papias, Melito of Sardis, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and others have seen this book as a prediction of events, a blueprint for the future. We know that the earliest extant commentary on Revelation is by Victorinus of Peto beginning in fourth century. He interpreted relating to the circumstances of his day and his approach was a blended approach bringing together Christology, ecclesiology and eschatology. He uses an exegesis that blends present relevance and eschatological prediction. And for him, Antichrist is associated with religious and civil corruption. Coming to the time of Augustine, though originally he believed in a thousand year reign in the futuristic time, uh, futuristic sense, he came under the influence of Tychonius and read the text as a source of insight, both eschatologically and for the contemporary church. So he explains that in his book, The City of God, he argued that with the coming of Christ, Satan has already bound and the eschatological elements like the Antichrist, Gog, Magog, uh, they are stripped of their eschatological significance and they relate to the experience of church in this age. In the later Middle Ages, I think the most influential figure is Joachim of Fiore. Uh, he used the revelation as a way to understand the salvation history. He used a very complex interpretative method using one part of the scripture to offer the model for interpreting the whole, which he called as Concordia and related the Old Testament and New Testament together. We know that he divided Revelation into eight parts and the first seven corresponds to seven periods of the church, which are then followed by eternity. Thus Revelation for him is providing a key to read the whole Bible. During the Reformation period, Bullinger was the only magisterial reformer to write a commentary on this book of Revelation. We know that Luther regarded this book as a subordinate uh, to a subordinate uh, place, um, and he did not consider this book either apostolic or prophetic, and he doubted the inspiration of this book. The winds of change uh, uh, started by 17th century by a person called Joseph Mede who argued for a key to interpret the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was interpreted in the light of events in Europe and many interpreters rejected uh, and neglected the world outside Europe, which continued even in 20th century. Joseph Mede gives a synchronic approach, seeing the book as a series of synchronism or recapitulations in which several passages are said to relate the same period of history. Later, with an existential individualistic appropriation in early Methodism, suggest a move from the world politics, and they understood this to a journey of a human soul. And we know that uh, uh, John Nelson Darby interpreted the book as unfulfilled prophecy in the letter. Right. And this is followed by the Schofield Bible disclosing the seven phases of spiritual. Right. Right. History. The historical critical methods, we come to the historical critical method, they focused on the past meaning, uh, most probably the preterist way of understanding this. We know that F.C. Bohr's approach of seeing text as a mirror of the conflict of the church considered revelation and an example of Jewish Christian anti-Pauline text. Tubingen Skoll uh, dated it early and therefore Frederick Engels regarded Revelation as the prime witness to the character of primitive Christian religion. 
We know that source critical analysis led to the skepticism on authorship. The next phase, uh, if you jump to, is the sociological readings gave only little impact to the study of revelation. Sociology of religion has been concerned with the rise of sectarianism and thus canvassing a sectarian origin for the book of Revelation. Studying this along with the millenarian movements resulted in the thinking that Revelation is a myth for an oppressed community that found itself confronted with the dissonance between its beliefs and socio-political realities of the militant Roman Empire by which the reader can overcome the contradiction between the present with its threat of persecution and the hope for life of bliss. The social psychological perspective, moving away from sociology of religion, used by Adela Yabo Collins to see how far this helps to deal with the aggression. The process of engaging with the book can bring out catharsis and displacement of difficult emotion. C.G. Jung juxtaposes the gospel and apocalypse as examples of different and unresolved aspects of human personality. For example, he says, the gospel a testimony of love and the apocalypse a cry of vengeance. Coming to liberation theology, liberation theology made it possible for many grassroots people to be uh, influenced and strengthened by the apocalypse. To example are from Alan Bozek, John's book for him cannot be understood outside his own political context, but as a prophecy does not receive its full and final fulfillment in one given historical moment only, but will be fulfilled at different times and in different ways in the history of the world uh, related beast uh, and he related beast with uh, apartheid of his time. Pablo Richard, Richard Pablo, seeks uh, bulk of revelation until 1910, chapter 1910, to be about the present, the challenge to the community and its role in the world. In the world. In the world. Through his examination of the structure, chapter 14 becomes the sender of the message of the book of revelation according to him and its own struggles. Only the final chapters for him being concerned with the eschatological judgment of the world. In the liberationist perspective, the book offers both hope and stimulate resistance. Jacques Ellul and William Stringfellow reflect how it challenged ideology by unmasking the principalities and powers. We also see feminist interpreters who most of them see a negative picturization of female symbolism in this book. For example, Tina Pippin, whereas Fiorenza is arguing for a what for a balanced view of the text. We will come to that in a little while. There were many interpretations that legitimized the colonialism as the fulfillment of prophecies in the book of Revelation. And this occasioned a lot of problems for the poor and the oppressed in the, in the world. Biblical studies keeping a European framework at the center envisioned an interpretation in which all that is good will represent the Europe and evil will represent the other geographical premises. Therefore, it needs to be interpreted from a post-colonial perspective, taking into consideration the imperial hegemonies, colonization, contextual realities, culture, symbols, and struggles. Historically speaking, there are four types of interpretation, allegorical, preteristic, historical, and futuristic. Right. All these approaches have some value because the book has certainly allegorical elements, spiritual insights, historical events, and prophetical features. So the book needs to be interpreted, taking the socio-historical and political cultural context seriously without losing the importance of symbolic content and rhetoric. Now look at the structure of the book. The structure of the book is very complex and many divide the structure uh, according to 119 in which you see the phrase what you have seen refers to the vision in chapter one what is now indicates the letters to seven churches in chapter two to three and the rest what will soon take place from chapter on chapter four onwards there are others who see repeated phrases what must come to pass or in the spirit as markers markers of the structure of this book 
the best one in this is the pro, uh, is one that is proposed by Richard Baucom. He argues uh, that the division seemed to be rational, providing a literary seam and unity between all these chapters. He avows that the major divisions of the book, in addition to the prologue and the epilogue, are inaugural vision, the inaugural vision of heaven, Babylon, the harlot, and the transition from Babylon to New Jerusalem, and the New Jerusalem, the bride. There are others who see the book as a seven act play in which each act has got seven scenes like Fiorenza and some argues for a uh, chiastic structure uh, like Loon. More often the, the three series of seven in chapters six to 16 are used as the basis of structure. However, the division proposed by Baucom brings more clarity in the literary seams between different sections in the book, which makes this book as a masterly work. Let's see, let's see the message of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation introduces itself as the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is a chain of revelation established from the beginning, which forms the interconnectedness between God, heaven, earth, and the intermediaries. God is the source of this revelation. It is given through Jesus Christ, though the, through the mediation of an angel, it is given to angel, the servant, uh, to be given to the people. The island of Patmos is the locale where John received this revelation. Contrary to the common portrayal, Patmos is not simply a barren, rocky, and lonely place, uh, but a very populated place, according to the archaeological evidences. There was a temple of Artemis and there was the evidence of a gymnasia. So John is drawing the readers to his visionary experiences so that the words, the readers here is not John's, but through him, the words of God, Christ and the spirit. Thereby, the hearers are brought into relation with the otherworldly realities. The spatial uh, uh, differences and distances are dismantled in this spiritual exercise. This interaction and the interconnection between heaven and earth is maintained throughout the book. The heavens are opened and John sees not only the heavenly throne room and its paraphernalia, but also how God is concerned about what is happening on earth. The last word on earth is not with demonic powers, but with God and the Lamb. The new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven in John's vision. Heaven and earth comes together, affecting each other and ends ultimately each other and ends ultimately transform into a new heaven and new earth. The first important thing is the message to the churches. David De Silva in his book, Seeing Things in John's Way, has brilliantly argued for the need of taking seriously the milieu of seven churches in Asia Minor. The audience of the book of Revelation suffered alienation, social pressure, and constantly allured by the Roman power and its promise of prosperity and peace. In addition to the conflict with the Romans and other Jewish sects, these churches also faced several internal problems. There were prophets who preached social accommodation and compromise, which definitely got a large following as in the church of Thyatira. John confronts the readers with his message of imminent visitation of God and his Messiah, the immediacy of God's visitation is emphasized repeatedly throughout the book. John's message is grounded in his vision of the risen Lord, appeared in all his glory beyond human expressions. This was not a lonely religious visionary experience, but this experience was in the fellowship of the spirit on the Lord's day, which disrupts the distance and connects John with the word of world of God and with the community as he received his com commission to write to them. The first visionary experience, he, he see the seven golden lampstands, which represent seven, seven churches. John is addressing concrete situation like the prophets of the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, Though the specific historic, economic, socio-political, and religio-cultural characteristics of these cities are recorded, these churches are asked to set their focus on a forthcoming event, and that is his coming with the clouds. 
So the readers are asked to be prepared for this coming. And if not, they will have to suffer the second death or their names will be deleted out of the, out of the book of life. There were other churches in Asia Minor, but these seven churches are addressed and the number seven is a very symbolic number of fullness. Thus, the seven churches in Asia Minor is a representation of the whole church, specifically the representation of all Asian churches. Persecution is a reality for many of the Asian churches, though it may not be as cruel as John Stein. There is allurement of the imperial promises of economic prosperity to those who bow down before the empire and conflicts with prophets of compromise who dilute the truth and remain silent without speaking truth to power. Poverty, malnourishment, homelessness, homelessness and socioeconomic disparities cannot be glossed over as we read the book of Revelation. The church is called to set its priority. She is told to be told not to be intimidated, but to be faithful until death. The church is instructed not to lose its cutting edge, the ability to say no, and not to dilute the word and accommodate the empire. The church is warned not to be dormant and soil the garment and encouraged to hold fast to the crown and chastise, not to be complacent and lukewarm. Ultimately, the church is called to conquer, not through violence, but through following the slain lamb, that is through the mothers of Ahimsa and Satyagraha. This is possible only through resistance and not through accommodating. The book of Revelation also gives a lot of ecclesiological metaphors. First of all, the church is the golden lampstand to give light in a dark world. Church is the bride of the lamb. Church is interpreted as the new Jerusalem. The church in the book of Revelation is a community tossed between Jewish cultural nationalism and Roman colonialism. Yet they are a community constantly engaged in worship. They are a community of saints. The second important message of the book of Revelation is worship. The central question is who is worthy of honor and worship? In answering this, John keeps the very throne of God very throne of God as the center of his visionary experience and display through his discourse the consequence of both giving God the honor that is exclusively God's due and violating God's honor by bestowing it to others. Though bestowing honor to the emperor and or any others other than God and the lamb may bring temporary advantages, it will ultimately result in disgrace and shame. Whereas Serving divine honors for God and the Lamb without accommodating would bring Christians great honor. Honor and shame was an important cultural value of the Mediterranean society, and it is so with Asian societies as, as well. Therefore, De Silva rightly calls this book as an honor discourse. In loudly proclaiming the Lordship of God and God's Messiah, the ruler of the earth and God's central position in the cosmos, the book of Revelation portrays numerous scenes of liturgy and worship. The series of vision opens with the portrayal of God sitting on the throne, surrounded by the concentric spheres of created beings who focus on the throne of God and worshiping God and the Lamb. Revelation shows rather than tells its audience how to offer prayer and worship. This is evident from the number of times proskunein, term for worship, is used 24 times. That indicates that worship is the central message of this book. The seven scenes of worship with powerful image of loud and dramatic liturgy serve several vital functions. In between the fourth and fifth scene, there is a demonic parody, uh, the worship of the beast. All these scenes affirm that worship and honor is exclusively God's due and reminds the audience that God is listening and will surely respond to their prayers for justice and peace. The shared songs and other forms of communal prayers generate solidarity in the ecclesia. They drown out uh, or belittle and parody the liturgy of both imperial cult and mystery cults in Romanesia. In addition to this, they contrast with the silencing of the song in the fallen, fallen Babylon. 
and they tell us what needs to be celebrated. In Revelation's portrayal of heavenly worship, the worthiness of God is explained as the creator and the worthiness of lamb is referred to as the act of redemption, pointing to the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. It is this worthiness of the lamb because of the acceptance of death at the hands of the empire in witness against empire's evil that empowers him to open the scroll and explain the meaning of history. Because God is the creator, all creatures of God, their very being, which needs to be acknowledged in worship. The lamb purchased back for God a holy people from every tribe and language and nation, making them a community of priests and kingdom for God, a hybrid community. This new act of creation through buying back at the cost of lamb's death demands definitely a passionate response in gratitude. In answering all power who is worthy of worship, all power is acknowledged to belong to the one on the throne. Worship is shown to be, a, to be primarily a political act. One worships whomever or whatever one affirms as, as uh, possessing true power to affect people's lives, uh, the central currency of politics in all ages. Just as in John's gospel, the affirmation of savior of the world and my Lord and my God are made in terms specific to the praise of the emperor Domitian. But now that is attributed to Jesus, so the casting of crown and the proclamation of our Lord and God in Revelation place the one on the throne in direct opposition to the emperor. It is not only that worship was political, worship of the one on the throne excluded worship of all other gods, gods and emperors. It is said that Revelation condemns empire and those who consciously support emperor's evil program. Once one knows that there is a God and that God stands against empire. One must choose whether one falls down in joyous worship or in stubborn resistance to that God. These worship scenes are filled with singing new songs, a practice long associated with biblical liturgical passages with celebration of a divine art of, of liberation. And I'm just skipping skipping that John is doing a remapping of the whole cosmos through this uh, liturgical scene. Let us come to the next important and the focal point of the message of the book. It is all about Christ and Christology. The phrase revelation of Jesus Christ at the very beginning reminds that Christology is at the heart of John's apocalypse. Witherington argues that John's reflection of Christ is a key to understand the work as a whole. There are various titles used, Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, Logos or Word, Lord and Lamb. The book of Revelation stresses the heavenly exaltation and roles of Jesus, which is attained through his death and resurrection. The Christological tone is set from the very beginning with a glorious vision of the risen Lord. The title Jesus Christ occurs three times in the first chapter along with various other titles like faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of earth, and the one who comes in the clouds for the future judgment. So we can, in nutshell, we can say that it is a titular Christology with a lot of titles John lavishing on Jesus Christ. The title that dominates the second part of the book is Lamb. And Revelation chapter 5, 5 states Christ as the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, a strong militaristic image of Davidic Messiah as the conqueror of nations, destroying the enemies of God. But the lion of Judah is an image taken from Genesis, but the image soon gives way to a slaughtered lamb. Thus, it is a lion lamb Christology. He appears not as a lion in the rest of the scene, but as a lamb. The discussions regarding the background of this imagery yielded so many suggestions because the term to slay echoes a sacrificial imagery and thus evidently points to the Passover lamb or lamb sacrificed in the temple. Uh, the description as lion and visualization as the slaughtered lamb is to convey the theme that the new conquest is achieved 
not through imperial means of violence, but through sacrificial death. David on comments that the imagery of the lamp in the book of Revelation has two primary motives as a ruler or a leader and as a sacrificial metaphor. It is no surprise that the same slain lamp imagery arises, uh, arises uh, repeatedly uh, in a document written to Christians who are being persecuted. And the lamb is described as standing, is a reference to resurrection, which is the victory over evil of the imperial agenda. Because the emperor can only kill the lamb or slaughter, but God is able to raise them up. We also see that Christology is also a martyr Christology because of the emphasis on the term faithful witness. And in addition to that, to cut it short, Christology in the book of Revelation is also a singable Christology. Hymns and songs were essentially modes of faith expression in the context of worship and liturgy in the Jewish and Greco-Roman society. The first century context displays a world of religiosity wherein songs and hymns were sung in praise of gods and goddesses. The early church also followed this mother and communicated their theological convictions through hymns and song. No wonder John presenting uh, his understanding of the first century audience described it in using hymns. Christ is worshipped by the living creatures, 24 elders, myriads of angels, and the whole creation through songs in loud voice with musical instruments and symbolic expression. The new song explained by the author's conviction about Christ, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the expression new is in the sense of distinctiveness, superiority, and nature. Thus, singable Christology is a clarion call for the readers to sing out their faith expressions in any context. And these songs are songs of resistance. The book is filled with images of God, theology. Only, only in two places, the book of Revelation, does God himself speak at the beginning and at the end. He is described as the Alpha and the Omega, the Pandocrator. And he, this designation Alpha and the Omega stems from Deutero Isaiah, wherein there are three times God declares, I am the first and the last. In their exilic context, this divine self-designation form part of the polemically motivated argument to assert Yahweh's sovereignty over against gods of Babylon. Richard Baucom notes that God precedes all things as their creator, and he will bring all things to eschatological fulfillment. He is the origin and God of all history. He has the first word in creation and the last word in new creation. In the Greek philosophy, this phrase is an indication of the eternity of the Supreme God. So it is about God's sovereignty. The self-designation of God is followed by two other epithets. That is one who is, one who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This is repeated five times with little variation in the book of Revelation. Revelation depicts God's activity as the creator and also as the, as the judge. This is because God alone is holy and true and righteous in judgment. There are series of judgments that we see in the book of Revelation in the series of uh, seven. We also see that theology of the book of Revelation, Baucom rightly says it is a highly contextual theology. The next, uh, the next important uh, topic is feminine images. I'm just skipping that by just mentioning the name. Jezebel is a historical, historical uh, uh, image that is used there. It is again used uh, of that compromising with the empire and he is using that one. The second one is a more complicated uh, female symbolism. The woman clothed with sun, it has so many, so many interpretation. Many people saw this as Mary and some saw this as Eve and some identified this as church and a more probable is to regard this as the whole Israel church in continuity with Israel, the messianic, the messianic community. There are uh, the next important message is uh, the next important message is 144 
uh, thousand followers of the of the lamb. This is again uh, in chapter seven and in chapter fourteen. The important uh, uh, information about this is they are used with the expression parthenoi in Greek, a feminine noun. So virgins, hundred and forty-four thousand is virgin. Again, hundred and forty-four thousand is uh, um, the the multiples. Uh, of 12, which is a complete figure, 12 into 12, and thus 1,000 times 12 into 12. So that is a complete figure in the numerical symbolism of uh, Revelation. These people, uh, John is adding the sim symbolic expression in stating that these figures have not defiled themselves with women, but have kept themselves as virgins. These people in Revelation 14 are not only ritually pure, but also virgins, it is implied that they go beyond the standard of purity required for holy war. This would mean that many immoral factors that were prevalent in the Roman ruled Asia Minor is implied in this symbolic expression of virgins. That means they are not part of the empire. This is a metaphorical expression referring to the people of God, both male and female. This is not a reference, reference to celibacy, but to those who refuse idolatry associated with the imperial cult. Now the next is the, the whore of Babylon, the whore of Babylon, and we know that this is a direct criticism against Rome. And just opposite to that is the new Jerusalem, and these are the two important female figures. One is Babylon, another is new Jerusalem. All the other figures are either siding with Babylon or with New Jerusalem. The female imagery of Revelation would be completely misconstrued if it were understood as referring to actual behavior of individual women, just as many feminist critics have used. Just as the image of lamb refers to an actual historical person and not to animals. So the images of heavenly uh, woman, the bride, or the harlots symbolize cities as the places of human culture and political institution and do not tell us anything about all those understanding of actual, actual women. Let's look at the images of evil in the book of Revelation. The author also develops negative images, images of evil and offers a heavenly perspective of a Roman empire that unmask its identity. One of the distinctive features of Romans chapter 13 and 17 is the image of the sea monster or the beast who will come from the sea, which is a description about what would happen in the immediate future. For the author of Revelation, the beast is representing Rome, the culmination and incarnation of all evil powers. The beast derives its power from the dragon. The book of Revelation portrays evil in its Trinitarian form, an imitation of God in Trinity. Dragon, the ancient serpent, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. We also see that beast is personified in the emperor Nero, and Nero is portrayed as the Antichrist, or he is the model of the Antichrist. The mysterious number 666 has been uh, uh, a subject of considerable debate among the New Testament scholars, and it is a considerable matter of debate among the popular preachers. And we know that even when Corona comes, many or any card that is issued, people immediately see 666 there, whether it is a ration card, or it is Aadhaar card, or it is PAN card, or any card that comes, people see uh, even during the time of Corona, people have initially said that the Corona vaccination is going to be a chip that is going to be implanted and they have tried to relate 666 with that. This is very fanciful interpretation according to their whims and fancies, but the text says it is a natural way to understand arithmos gar anthropo estin for it is the number of a man is that the number relates to the name of some human individual. One of the most popular interpretation is to consider it standing for Nero Caesar. However, this image needs to be read along with the beast in Revelation 17. And therefore it is important to see their interconnection. We should also see that uh, beast is portrayed in the book as a parody 
right? Just as God and Christ is portrayed, beast is also portrayed to mimic, mimic God and the lamb. But the difference is beast was and is not and is to come. Whereas God was and is and is to come. He is of all, all times the sovereign. Now, ultimately, we are coming to the uh, one of the last uh, uh, important, last but the important, the hope of a despairing world is that the book of Revelation ends with a vision of God's new heaven and new earth. This new world order is described from chapter 21 onwards. This could be called as the manifesto of Christ's second coming. This is placed between the tales of two great cities, Rome, which is destroyed, whose smoke rises up to heaven, and the other is Jerusalem that comes down, comes down from, from heaven. After describing the unholy trinity being thrown into the lake of fire, the author presents the new heaven and the new earth. This new world is prepared for his people who are symbolically presented as the new Jerusalem, which is the saved community of Christ all over the world. Why God creates this new world? This is because the present world order has become a world built upon lies, hypocrisy, murder, glorification of violence, poverty, tears, and economic disparities and exploitation. No wonder other passionately longs for a new world. It is in the spirit John sees God engaged in this work of a new creation. Not the idea of heaven, though it is not completely evaded, in this vision, the idea of new Jerusalem and new Eden on the renewed earth comes to the fore. In the new world that God creates, the dichotomy of heaven and earth, which is in the sinful age, would be broken. And when the old heaven and the old earth are destroyed, the new heaven and the new earth becomes one. Okay. We are now looking at uh, the contextual significance of this one, and I want to read through this. This is only a paragraph. Having skimmed through the book of Revelation, we summarize the main findings that we have, we have observed. The book of Revelation is a minefield which continues to excite as one digs deeper into it. Though the name is Apocalypsis Disclosure, the book seems to be a veil closure document precisely because of the interpretation according to the whims and fancies of the interpreter. What we have now is a cacophony in a sense of voices which do not allow the reader a clear hearing. There have been several ways in which the book is interpreted and the nuanced meaning thereby cause such cacophony. Most often, certain dogmatic points of view is read into the text in order to silence every other voices, we need the humility to understand the fact that the book is more dramatic than dogmatic, more musical than prosaic, more visionary than programmatic. The book has been treated often among many as a straightforward account of the end of the world, thus minimizing its present contextual relevance. Such interpretations are usually linked with other prophetic and eschatological texts like Daniel, Ezekiel, First Thessalonians to produce a very coherent eschatological chronology and program. There are others who relate the visions with the ancient first century context. There are others who interpret the images as the account of struggles facing the journey of the soul to God. The book has been used as an interpretative lens to view the history. The important thing is to recognize this book as an apocalypse, a hybrid literature, hybrid genre, which requires its readers different interpretative skills, including imaginations and emotions. The socio-historic background of this book, its moorings with the apocalyptic and prophetic traditions, the use of images and metaphors, geopolitical and socio-cultural pointers in the text, the rhetoric through which it attempts to produce hope to the readers, its resistance against the empire and possibility of fresh imaginations needed serious attention in understanding the text. Apocalyptic offers us no excuse for resorting into a life of fantasy. Rather, a clear understanding would lead us to a more informed and obedient life. According to the book of Revelation, to live in this way may be controversial and costly precisely because to live such a life 
is to refuse to conform to the expectations of the empire hegemonies. It demands, it demands a higher degree of resistance, of course, through speaking truth to the power and following the slain lamb. It is also an invitation that we must be wary of hermeneutical strategies that would prevent us from making full use of this book, which would enable us to understand what to resist and who is worthy of worship. The demand of becoming part of the community of the lamb, following the path of Ahimsa and Satyagraha in resisting every overt and subtle attempts of allurement to collaborate with the agenda of the empire, infusing hope amidst people who encounters the dances of death around them in diverse forms and singing out our faith expressions in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, taking cue from our own traditions and to move into a musical, hymnal, hermeneutical engagement in developing our singable theologies or Christologies is the clarion call of the book of Revelation for its contemporary readers. This is the way for a new heaven and new earth as we look forward for a world of justice and peace, the new Jerusalem, the dwelling of God among human. Let me conclude by quoting Fiorenza, who encapsulates the importance of the book of the Revelation, book of Revelation in her famous book, Revelation Vision of a Just World. Revelation will elicit a fitting response only in those socio-political situations that cry out for justice. Revelation's language of divine kingship and royal reward, as well as its ethical dualism, stands against unjust authority and champions the oppressed and the disenfranchised. When Christians join the power structures of their society and seek to stabilize them. This same rhetorical world of vision serves to sacralize dominant authorities and preach against their enemies. One may either sing out the songs of the slain lamb or sing for the empire or slaughterers. Singing for the empire and advocating its agenda may bring fringe benefits in a temporal world, but it stands judged and punished in the heavenly eternal world. Singing the lamb song may be controversial and costly, and it is ultimately rewarding because he alone is worthy of worship. It resists the imperial programs and envisions a new world. In this sense, it is a new song, not repeating the conventional ones. A revelation repeats this phrase, let anyone who has an ear listen, Mara Nada, our Lord. Thank you so much, Sir Bizu Chako, for such an erudite and scholarly presentation. You gave us a great insight on the book of Revelation. Usually, Revelation is considered to be the most difficult book to understand. However, through your presentations, you make in such a way that Revelation would be easily understand seeing the socio-political context. Friends, uh, we will now invite our open short time for discussions. Since we are running behind the time, I will now just call or a comment. You may do so. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, I am George Philip from uh, Union Biblical Seminary, Pune. I appreciate uh, my dear friend, Dr. Biju Chako, for his uh, wonderful presentation on this uh, book of Revelation. Uh, really, we appreciate you. I have a small doubt in relation to the words that you use, Ahimsa and Satyagraha, as part of the uh, role of the community, community of the land. So what is the, can you just a little more explain, what is the role of the saints, means the community of the land? My con question is in relation to the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially in relation to the War Scroll and the New Jerusalem Scrolls, where the community, Kumaran community, had an active role in the eschatological battle. 
uh, whether whether the Christian community, Christian saints also have such a, a active role in the eschatological battle or in relation to your understanding of the resistance towards the empire. The, 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 uh, the position of the resistance varies from uh, book to book, something like uh, from Romans, from First Peter, from Revelation, you know, there is a various type of uh, understanding of the resistance towards the empire. So can you a little more, a little bit clearly, can you say what is the role of the saints, whether it is active or passive, apart from the worship? Thank you. Shall I, shall I answer or should I listen to other? Uh, you may please respond, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. George Philip, uh, uh, for uh, raising that question. Of course, we can, we can study the book of Revelation in relation to the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially the War Scrolls, as you have rightly mentioned, because the Qumran community also expected that they are living in the end times and the Messiah is going to appear and therefore they need to participate in the war along with the, because they were all expecting a very military kind of a geopolitical type of messianic kingdom. But that is not the expectation in the book of Revelation. And John actually, though moves in the prophetic apocalyptic traditions of the Old Testament, he Mr. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. George Philip, for uh, that question. Um, Dead Sea Scroll or the War Scroll is very important for us to understand uh, uh, understand the Book of Revelation and how John is reinterpreting those traditions. John is not simply buying something from the traditions that he is used. Rather, he is engaging in a creative hermeneutical attempt. In the war scroll, in the Qumran community, we know that they also believe that they are living in the end times. And they believe that they have to participate with the Messiah in the war, in the eschatological war. And therefore, uh, they need to keep uh, the purity that is demanded for uh, the soldiers during the war time. So they were using that. But when it comes to revelation, see, we need to understand that there was a geopolitical, a very political ex expectation of a messianic kingdom. And that geopolitical expectation is uh, toned down in the book of Revelation. Look at the way in which Jesus at the center of the book resist the empire and the programs and how he waged wars with the empire. That is through giving himself as a sacrifice. But speaking truth to the power, he did not dilute speaking truth to the power. At the same time, what he has done is he gave himself. So it is a slain lamb standing up. This, this is like a cartoon picture. If you want to imagine Revelation, from a cartoon point of view, look at the cartoon picture that John is bringing before the readers, right? Here is a lamb that is slain and we know that nowhere a slain lamb can stand. And this is the reversal and uh, uh, hermeneutical freshness of, of, of the writer. Here is the slain lamb is standing where God is the authority behind that. And therefore his resistance is through self-giving. And that's where the point of Ahimsa, Satyagraha comes into play, right? The church in the world can resist not through amassing weapons for a military fight, but by speaking truth to the power. And even if they have to give their life like the master, and this is what uh, Rodney Stark writes uh, in his book, The Rise of Early Christianity, about the early Christian history, when he says, he says that uh, uh, when there is an epidemic, you know, the Christians would stay there and they will nurse the affected people. They will not run away to the secular places. And that is why Christianity grew in the early, early centuries. And if somebody asks, why are you doing, risking your life, 
they will say that we are just following our master who put his life in the line to save all of us it is for such a resistance the book is calling so some uh, questions are raised here in the chat box one is from sunil ap what is your take on the two witnesses mentioned in revelation 11 there have been speculations that the two witnesses are either moses and eliza or enoch or and eliza yeah. and in theological circles it is widely believed that two ordinary believers whom god calls to be his witnesses in the end times yeah uh, yeah, I, I don't think there, are, there is going to be, uh, you know, in my reading and my understanding, literally the two persons are coming and going to witness. It is the two types of witnesses in the Mosaic type of and the Elijah type, the prophetic uh, and the priestly type of that witness, which is referred uh, as the two witnesses. I think that is the best way to take it instead of uh, going with whether it is Moses, Elijah, Enoch, Elijah, and confusing all believers with those kind of, whether it is literally Moses or Elijah, or Enoch or Elijah, what is the difference that is going to make? It is, the call is to witness, right? and the church is called to witness. I think that is the main point of the book. And another question is from Om Prakash. The question is, is yeah. there any link between Revelation triple six and First Kings chapter 10, 14, triple six, talents of gold? I, I haven't uh, read about uh, that relation, so I am not able to answer that question. Uh, we may refer back uh, those relation between the Old Testament and the New Testament and may, uh, uh, and may interpret. But in uh, uh, Revelation, um, uh, 666 is a reference to evil. Six is imperfection. No, seven is, if seven is perfection, six is imperfection. Triple, three times uh, six means it is triple assertion of the imperfection in its sin in its full form. That is called triple six. Right. And another question is, uh, can you please elaborate Zevis Merkaba mysticism from Samuel Sunit. Yeah, the Merkaba mysticism is, as we see, the mystical uh, idea that we see in the book of Revelation. Like you see the visions of thrown chariots, you know, the char seeing the visions of thrown chariots, that type of a mystical understanding. We may, we may take the help of Old Testament scholars in further describing uh, whether there is uh, the, the differences between this uh, mystical understanding in the Old Testament. So, uh, is there anyone who would like to raise a question? We can uh, call one or two more questions and we shall close our uh, session. Milan, can I ask, please? Yes, please, Suk. Yeah, Reverend Sukumar from ECC, the program executive. Over to you, Suk. Thank you very much, Dr. Bijo Chako, for the outstanding presentation. You are brilliant and genius. My question is regarding the musical expressions that you expressed in your presentation. I'm a student of music and history. I have two simple questions. Number one, what were those musical instruments that were played by uh, biblical communities, especially from the context of Revelation? Second question, most of the biblical music when we do some research, especially from the Old Testament, uh, most of the scales are in minor form. Very few we see major scales. Uh, this is a question that has been haunting me for many years. Do you have any idea of differences between why more minor scales in biblical music? Thank you very much, Dr. Biju. Yeah, thank you uh, for that question, uh, Reverend Suguma. You are more musical than me. Uh, <laughs> in understanding the scales, uh, minor and major. Uh, so I think uh, you are in a more advantaged position to answer the question that you raise. But uh, thank you for raising that. What I am trying to propose, 
the early christian faith one of the best way they express their faith was through songs then there is no doubt in that whether you it is not through process it is not through see if you look at the communities just like uh, many of the traditional communities in the orality oral culture through the folk songs how they communicated their traditions their faiths and their beliefs and practices here is the biblical community and i believe the early christologies were sung and not written and you have uh, the best hymns uh, probably it may as a musician you may know that it may it may uh, lack the rhythm of a perfect song or a hymn or it may lose uh, those uh, 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 rhythmic uh, lines right or uh, in terms of music it may be only minor uh, scales uh, but then they have sung it they have sung it and therefore the important uh, uh, note is that we can sing out our christology and singable is an expression used by professor tangaraj who was in uh, madurai uh, now uh, somewhere in the west i do not know uh, he used this expression in one of his articles and i'm taking from there and then uh, trying to say that uh, we can develop uh, singable christologies for our time and you know as you, you know songs are the best way to express our faith expressions just as songs are the best way to spread heresy and we are sometimes singing wrong theologies through our songs it is because it is widely spread every people easily accept that yeah thank you so much uh, dr biju chako for doing such an in depth study on the book of revelation it was greatly enlightening and friends uh, we are almost 30 minutes exceeding our time uh I shall now call uh, Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti for concluding remarks and announcements. Over to you, sir. So, hello, friends. It is a wonderful time to have all of you here together, and especially, I am very happy and thankful to God that uh, uh, Dr. Biju Chako was used well among us. today even in time and he is always okay a different and difficult person okay in terms that he was always trying to outsmart others okay he is not trying to outsmart he is always outsmarting others so that i could see his development as a bd student he was a first class person in mth he was a first class person and also during his dth he was coming out in flying colors so thank you dr biju for your excellent presentation and uh, many of the participants participants are asking your uh, ppt uh, please send us so that we can distribute among them so that they may have an in depth understanding and is that when we think about the book of revelation it can be interpreted allegorically as he has rightly mentioned and historically prophetically symbolically and also in a protest manner and sir while i was studying in india i was not able to study the book of revelation but when i went to the west is that i intentionally took a course on what does the book of revelation really mean okay that gave me multifarious understandings of this particular mysterious book So now Dr Biju Chako was teaching me a no- lot of new lessons I was open to learn okay new aspects with regard to this particular book and especially we know that when we come to the book of revelation we are very much comfortable with the first three chapters but when it comes from chapter 4 onward a lot of okay mysteries symbolism and figurative language okay instead of it is revealing rather it conceals a lot of things that is the way the book of revelation develops as a whole so in a context of imperial cult and the emperor worship 
John envisions a new world order where Christ rules forever. It is a last literary masterpiece with a lot of irony. This is the book. It is a book of music, especially ethnomusicology is at the center of this particular book. And also it is a book of victory. Okay, it is a book of victory. And also this book of so in that it is better to read this book multi failure times so that you may get a larger understanding of a particular book. And about the next week, in 300 words, you have to write to the next assignment. The next assignment is all about you write in 300 words. Sir, can you hear us? So I think he has some uh, connection issue. We will uh, send to WhatsApp group. So he has come back, my love. Oh, he has come back. Uh, is the book of Revelation is paradigm context of religious persecution and minority issues in a context. That is the assignment. Another thing I wanted to inform is that uh, tomorrow there is a program that is conducted by ECC in all the disturbed members of this group. Okay, especially the wider contextualized biblical hermits group. That is the uh, uh, M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. M. Dr. M.A. Thomas was the founder of ECC. And this is the 24th uh, M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. ECC would like to invite you who are registered for this course. Our Dr. J. Kiran Sebastian is the person who gives the key address at sharp by 6 o'clock tomorrow. And the next week, um, next, sorry, is that this is the 21st lecture. We have four more to go. Okay. So the next lecture is all about a contextual interpretation of the notice. The contextualization of the that is delivered by Dr. Stanley Jones. Okay. So Dr. Stanley Jones was with Dr. Biju Chako all through the time, PD, MTH, and uh, DTH, I think. And he is a professor at the Union Biblical Seminary. And he is going to deliver the next lecture. And uh, uh, may God bless all of us, and thank you for coming uh, over to uh, me. I am also happy to uh, tell that, uh, our uh, Minlun, the Vice President of, sorry, uh, Vice Chairman of ECC, is blessed with a boy. Am I right? Yes, yes. Okay, Thank so you. we need to congratulate him. May yes. God bless you. Okay, over to you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, friends, as uh, Dr. Johnson had uh, mentioned, tomorrow is the 27th M.A. Thomas Memorial Lecture. Uh, in the previous years, we used to invite friends and well results of ECC to come and participate in these exciting and important lectures because of the uh, pandemic COVID-19, the executive committee decided to conduct through Zoom online. So we request you to participate in the same timing, 6 p.m. Please uh, make yourself available and this is an honest request from ECC. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Biju.